so uh, uh, fair warning. Is that now? I have no ready lecture, that's why I'm able to do this twice, because it's not going to be the same. Um, we, we're just going to uh, have some kind of open discussion. The, I, I'll hear you. If you want to ask, you'll ask, and I'll try to answer. Um, I'll start out with a two-minute uh, video, just reminding us of the, you know, the sites and uh, whatever. <laughs> it's been almost a year, and and we'll take it on from there. Okay. My 16-year-old son, Naftali, sends us a text and he says he's on his way home. Next thing we know, we're in the middle of the most surreal situation. The three Israeli teens disappeared. Abducted, quote, by a terrorist organization. The Israeli army staged huge security sweeps looking for the missing teenagers. The country has really been riveted on this story. People gather to call for the safe release of three teenage boys. We just want them back in our homes in their beds. We just want to hug them again. Authorities believe those boys are now dead. The bodies of three missing Israeli teens have been found. Israel is mourning as funerals were held for the three teens. The grief and outrage over these murders tonight in Israel is extraordinary. Those 18 days, they were filled with the darkest hours, but also amazing hours. We discovered our family, our friends, our community, our country, our people. People all over the world had thousands of grassroots initiatives. I spoke to people in Cape Town, in Kathmandu, in Australia. There were delegations from all over North America, Europe. People all over were saying, these are not just your boys, these are our children. Sometimes I ask myself, was this just an illusion? And I have this image of a person walking in the dark and it's raining and they're stumbling and they're figuring out their way, don't see anything. And then for a second there's lightning. And in that lightning, they see the reality of their surroundings. It helps them guide their way. We had days and days of lightning. It's no illusion. What we saw about ourselves, we're part of something huge. We're part of a people, of a true family. That's for real. Somebody called our home and said, you know, I'm considered a non-affiliated Jew. I want to tell you, I feel so affiliated. Cain asks, am I my brother's keeper? I think our answer came out loud and clear. We are one family, and I am my brother's keeper. It's no illusion. Even if day-to-day -day life doesn't feel like this, what we saw was real. Rosh Hashanah is coming up. Let's all choose an act, large or small, to keep the spirit of those days alive. It was said, we went out searching for the boys and we discovered ourselves. I don't want to assume any of you were any specific place emotionally last year, but I happen to know that, that many, many of you were, were with us throughout the whole ordeal. When you heard about the kidnapping, when you, when you were you know, following the search, checking news ten times a day, um, having the, the, the names in your prayer books, and, and coming especially to school on vacation to do something first you know, in their merit, then in their memory. Um, I feel like you were all partners in, in this with us, and it truly meant the world to us. And I know people experience a lot of things in a lot of different ways. This is our ex experience, and I can't imagine it otherwise because people were so supportive and, and amazing. So I just want to say a simple toda, really, from the bottom of our heart. heart. I speak for uh, the Yifach and Shah family too. And whatever, but I'll, I'll keep it at that. It's it's really a, a deep, deep, deep thank you for, for yeah, just for being brothers and sisters. Thank you. 
So um, there will be a lot of different things we can speak about, and there isn't all that much time, so you choose what's interesting to you and, and go ahead. No, no question is too personal because I've learned how to dumb questions. I don't want. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Were you always this optimistic, like before? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, this horrible tragedy happened and I became Pollyanna. <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess yeah, I, I guess there's something to say about a person's natural tendencies. Uh, um, I also have a lot of good reasons. Uh, uh, we have a, a pain and a wound in our life, but we have a lot, a lot of blessing. And uh, yeah, I guess the answer is <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for being first. <laughs> how do you yeah. spread the word about you know, the three boys? How did, how did it travel so fast? I have no idea. It was like, um, for us it started 3.30 at night, we were woken up by, by policemen, and within a couple of hours we knew that the last location of the cell phones was in the Hebron area, so we knew we were in deep, deep trouble. And um, Within the school, they were searching. They were they were making a million phone calls and uh, you know saying in all the WhatsApp groups. Uh, and and then the news traveled so fast; it was way beyond my control. Um, I remember that uh, we sent our kids to school without telling them anything because we wanted to deal with the situation. And two hours later, I already realized that the whole world knows with the names and everything. And I went to my school to to the girls' school to to. Uh, to speak to them before somebody else asked them anything, and they were in the middle of some kind of cel celebration. So I, uh, I, I, I went over <laughs> just to, you know, they didn't want to leave because it was this happy event, and I was just standing there to watch that nobody's coming, nobody's approaching them, which proved to be a totally surreal situation because there were other other parents there that already knew and they didn't understand what I'm doing there. So it, it, things happen so quickly. I think it's you know a lot you know, what's up and everything else. E even the, the rumor, I, I, I guess it didn't come here, but in Israel uh, at some point there was somebody wrote up a beautiful piece that said that there was a, a, a rescue operation by Tal and they were all home safely and that traveled so fast that um, within a, f a few minutes after it started I started getting tons of, uh, you know, blessings and congratulating uh, texts and it didn't hurt me because we had an IDF team in our home. This is part of you know, the collective wisdom of the state of Israel. We've gone through this before and we know that a family that, that goes through this needs someone to hold their hand, a babysitter that was with us 24-7 throughout the whole ordeal. And I knew if anything's true, it's going to come from them. But I had to answer a lot of people, oh, not yet, Bezat Hashem, not yet. Uh, so, so I don't know, things traveled so quickly. Within two days, people in, in the Far East told us that they saw the names in the shuls. Uh, so, yeah. 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 Yes. Um, how did you, did you find that your views of, of the, the conflict in, in Gaza and, and Palestinians were really changed because of, of the incident? Yeah. You're asking if my politics changed. Um, no. Just, just your views of Palestinians in general. Um, no, the, 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 you know, I, it's not my field of expertise, not, not, uh, not being a general and not being a politician, but um, the, the situation in our area is so complex that I was never <coughs> naive. And though I have this general, you know, uh, wish for peace and everything uh, working out, it, nothing's going to happen very fast or very easy. So, um, ba basically nothing's changed. Um, and I, I do see a lot of the, uh, the Palestinian population being held hostage by their leaders. They were being abused horribly. They were, you know, uh, for, us, for us if it was all about protecting our, uh, our, um, not our civilian population, for them it was all about Making sure that they have enough uh, enough uh, casualties to to use as propaganda. It, it, it was a very very complex situation. So I feel for them, but uh, there's also something about the morality of staying strong and protecting your people. Nothing basic has changed. Uh, what was your first thought or emotion when you heard the news? The final news. Yeah. <laughs> the truth. 
He said, oh, it could have been such a kiddush Hashem if we'd gotten him back alive. Um, it was uh, the the whole the whole eighteen days uh, had had a, a quality of being difficult but very very intensive very you know it was a bit of a glory trip because everybody was coming in was dramatic and we were trying to do things and whatever and that those hours I, I experienced as a physical pain that you know my, my body remembers so it's. Uh, but that's, that's just the point of time of discovery. Then, then there's life. Yeah. You yes, uh, we didn't know them ahead of time. Gilad is a classmate of Naftali. They actually sat together in class. They sat together in Beit Midrash, but they weren't the best of friends, just friendly. And uh, Eyal was two years older than them, and he was. Uh, they just met him in the bus station. Uh, actually, the same bus station that there was another terrorist attack yesterday. God, nobody was killed. We, one of the chasadim of this whole story uh, was that we were put together with you know, six people, six adults, parents, uh, all very anxious, very worried, uh, and, and you had to trust the people that are with you in this story because we felt that anything we do or might do, might not do, uh, could affect their fate. So um, thank God we, we, we were with people that we can trust and, and we connected with them and we're still very much in touch with them. We have our own WhatsApp group. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, how did you re react to Operation Prevent Revenge? We were part of it just like anybody else. My, my nephews were in Gaza just like anybody else's. And uh, we were worried and involved, and it, 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 it was our experience like anybody else. Uh, some people were constantly pointing out the fact that maybe if, the, if it wasn't for, for the boys, uh, the terrorist tunnels wouldn't have been discovered on time. I never presume to know how Hashem runs the world, so I, I never make these kind of connections. Because of this, that happened. But I can say very clearly that what I saw with my own eyes, that how we got to the operation socially was created in those 18 days. When, when, you, when you have a, you're going through a war and, it's, uh, and, you're, and your society is all torn apart and, and distant and doesn't feel the connection, doesn't understand what it's all for, it, it's, and there, it's a difficult, we had missiles all over, we had casualties, it, it was a difficult war, it was a long war too. And it's, we came to it as a different people. We, these 18 days of, of searching and connecting and reaching out to each other, all kinds of different uh, Jews and Israelis and non-Jewish non Israel, non Israelis. Um, it was an amazing experience that solidified us in a way that prepared us for the war <coughs> in a different way. So, you know, I, just like I wouldn't say the tunnels were fine because of our children, I'm not saying anything in, in about this happened because of something else, but it's a, it's a process that I saw happen in, in, with my eyes. Um, uh, otherwise, you know, I don't have to do the whole Hasbara spiel, but uh, uh, we were doing our best not to, not to, not to hurt innocent people in, in Gaza, and it was, an, uh, it was no way to come out of it in the best uh, shape, you know, it was a, an impossible mission. Uh, and not, not to tower uh, with Tzedek. <laughs> yes? Um, how, did, how did your police and God, uh, why didn't they change after this experience? Why didn't a uh, thought pass through your mind such as, how could um, a supreme being allow this to happen? I'm aware of the notion that uh, that belief in God changes after, when when you go through a hard, hard experience. Uh, I think it might have it, it probably has a, a deep psychological truth to it uh, about the hardship. I feel it's totally irrational. Um, before hard, difficult, evil things happen to other people, this time they happen to me. What does that change anything? Um, it's. For me, being in a very vulnerable, vulnerable, uh, fragile uh, position was uh, a lesson in humility, which is a lesson in emunah, which gives you proportions. 
Uh, the thing I want more than anything else in the world was totally out of my, my control. Um, I, I, I feel it's, I'll, I'll put it this way. Somehow I feel the need to say it because I think it might be relevant to other people. Um, for some people, Emunah is a never-changing, stable rock of their life. And for other people, it's, it's very, like myself, it's always, it has been very, very um, dynamic. Sometimes you feel very close, sometimes you feel more distant, sometimes you feel totally estranged, and sometimes you walk out to a starry, starry sky and you say, really? And, and I've been in all those places. And it's fine with me. For me, it's part, it's a relationship. It's totally dynamic. Um, so Dafka, for me, being in this, in this very, you know, fragile place, it, it, was, uh, it, it brought me together. Um, my, my, my prayer became more real. And not because I was expecting any immediate results to prayer. I never, I never looked at prayer that very before, and definitely, <laughs> definitely not after. Um, but just having a relationship, standing before God, is, is an experience that's more real to me. <clears throat> um, you guys, you're saying about the, you know, in a, in a pagan world, you have uh, you have the, the the bad guys and the the bad gods and the, that are very forceful and the merciful gods that don't have no force, and then you say, oh, they they argued with this, each other and something went wrong and that's how something bad happened, you know, somehow it fell between the the authorities of the different gods. And in one, in, in a, in a monotheistic uh, theology, you have a real problem because the one that's perfectly good is also the perfectly powerful one. So how could bad things happen? But the truth is, that's the world we live in. Uh, in the tefillah we say, shalom akol, but that's just politically correct for the original Pasuk in Ishayal that says, So apparently there is evil in the world. Um, also, I must say, on a, on a very personal level, uh, in the funeral, there were three, for us, three stages. There was a very, like, 150,000, I don't know, tons of people in the last part. They got stuck there in traffic for hours. <laughs> and before that, we came from three communities, and we had communal services. And for that, we spent a few minutes alone in the room with Neftemi. And I remember uh, thinking how tall he was. He wasn't finished growing yet. and. And I remember, I remember Avi was speaking to him, and I had this distinct feeling of this is my son's body, it's not my son. So I, I know we know how to speak about it, but that experience was so real for me, it was so in my face, that, that it's part of my spiritual world now. Um, somebody <coughs> called me right after the shiva, so I don't know how she got my number, and she said, I'm very angry with Hashem about what happened. Somebody told me I should call you. I said, okay, really? <laughs> like, well, what do you expect from me? And so I told her what you probably would have told her, that being angry is a form of relationship. And you're angry, so be angry. For me, anger is a waste of energy. I have too much to deal with, thank God. And, and I don't want to go there. It, it, it totally drains me out of any, any energy I have. But, um, so. Kids, so I have no real answers, but this is how I, this is my role. <laughs> gives you the strength to like open up about pretty much everything that happened with practically the entire world. Um, I'm just an extravagant person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the truth is, in the beginning we were, we were working very intuitively. Um, we, uh, within 48 hours we understood that the world has been turned upside down to, to find our boys. And, and you know, there are the soldiers and the people in the intelligence that are work, working around the clock. And it was very hot in the daytime and very dangerous in the nighttime. nighttime. And then there are, there are parents that, that are calling them what never happens in Israel. They, they, you know, mothers live from Shabbat to Shabbat when they see their soldiers. And they were calling their boys and saying, don't come home without the kids. And, and there were people, you know, praying all over and Jews contacting the, their parliament members and, and the Congress people and, and arranging a meeting with the Pope and, uh, and something in the in Geneva and the Human Rights Council. And everybody was doing their best and we felt the need to come out and say thank you. And so that's how it started. And 
later on, we spoke when we felt the need to speak. There was a horrendous <coughs> murder of a 16-year-old uh, Arab boy in Muhammad Abu Khadir in, in Jerusalem. We felt we have to speak out about how horrible it is. Uh, there was foreign press to speak with during the war. Uh, I, I got to, to meet uh, uh, Kerry, the Secretary of State, um, which was you know, more of a press opportunity than, than anything else. Uh, so, so we did what we felt we had to do. We were very focused on, on the mission. After that, uh, besides you know taking care of the kids and and going back to work, there's a sense of responsibility to I don't know make the best of, of what happened. There's a, it was it was a horrible tragedy, but there was a lot of sweet around that bitter, and, and we're, we're I feel like it's it's our you know, our, our goal to, to take the sweet out of the bitter. And there was some kind of, you know, in Hebrew we say something, something special at that time, that if there's something of it that we can, some spirit of it that we can keep, and maybe some of it could come through meeting, you know, 11th and 12th graders in Hebrew Academy here. So, so we do it. Um, I, I don't think this is a long-term long -term thing. Uh, I think at this point in time, this is what I'm busy with, amongst other things. Um, but it's not the shed, it will all calm down. <laughs> so. yeah. um, do you find that, that your tragedies have been used by, by others, by, by politicians, and by, by the media to sort of almost take it away from you and turn it into something else? Um. I, I, if that happened, I'm not aware of it. Um, I think the, out, the outrage was real, and uh, and the coming together was real, and and then we went into a very difficult war, and I didn't feel much abuse of it. Um, politicians in America didn't bother to relate to it altogether. Not that he was an American citizen, Obama didn't say a word. Um, no, I, 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 I don't live under that impression. I might be wrong, but that's not part of my experience. It's becoming very cold. Can we turn it? <laughs> <laughs> yes? If you got, <coughs> sorry, that if you got enough followers to say that they were alive but being ransomed, would that have changed uh, their death in any way? I, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, basically, everybody was very honest with us all the time. We knew that there were shots being, we, there was this recording of, of uh, um, we knew that there were weapons used, and uh, we were told very clearly by the Prime Minister and Minister of Defense and you know everybody that they might have killed everybody, they might have just wanted to scare them and they were all alive, maybe they're wounded, maybe they wanted one hostage and not three. There was a lot of information pointing out that what was planned was a hostage situation for negotiation. We have to this day, two of the killers were, were uh, died in, a, in Hebron, El uh, Rosh Hashanah, but uh, the third one that has in his testimony how he was waiting for a sign to start feeding them and the whole... So, so it, it, as a plan, it was a plan for hostages. When he asked the, the terrorists, why did you murder them? Why did you kill them? Uh, they said they resisted. I don't know if it's true. Um, for me, I don't think any, I mean, I, I assume that there's a chance that we'll get them back alive. I was preparing myself for a long-term negotiation. Um, what it, the truth is, since the final, you know, since the result is what, what it actually is, uh, it's easier for me to think of something that was over in a minute or two. And I have more information to know that the process of, of, of the murder wasn't painful for Naftali, uh, which, you know, it calms me down rather than those 18 th days where I could have spent so much time thinking about, are they tortured? Are they, you know, stuck in, are they going insane? Are they together? Are they alone? Are they being fed? Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, the Israeli government uh, has put the, the name of the Palestinian boy was killed on the memorial for terrorists, and there was like a, a bunch of conflict on both sides. How did you 
being like sort of an undisputed family member of a, a terrorist that could react to that? The, the, you know, when it first happened, we, we, uh, when the murder first happened, we couldn't believe it has anything to do with our story. We thought it's probably criminal or whatever. And within two days, the police was, was in our home saying, we got, the, we got the murderers and it's a hate crime. And once it's defined as a hate crime, we should understand that this is hate crime. Hate crime gets to be on the plaque, okay? And, and if they thought they're doing anything to correct something, they should get it in their face, seriously. I wish they would know that, it, that it's there. Um, uh, the Abukhdira family is in a, in a whole different place. Uh, they don't want anything to be you know, uh, connected to the Zionist story. And they're being used as propaganda, which is very understandable. Um, on the, uh, you know, the murder itself is as horrendous as any murder. It was very cruel, too. Uh, the way society to react, reacted to it was all different. Uh, the murder of, of, of the mother of the murderers of our children said uh, she'd be proud of them until Judgment Day, and this and, and a lot not all but a lot of the Palestinian society was celebrating it. Some were. Um, so uh, <coughs> the Israeli society, anybody I don't know anybody that wasn't horrified by the murder of Muhammad Abu Um in, within two days, they were in detention. They were they stood trial. As a, as a society, we were acting all different. There was a BBC interview uh, not so long ago, like two months ago, with uh, with our family and with Abu Khadir family separately. And at some point, they asked us about each other. So when they asked me about them, I told them what you know we spoke at. We we, we said it's. It's against our, our whole basis of being an LT Israel. You, you can't let innocent blood being shed. But yeah, then they asked their father, and the father said, "Oh, that never happened. It's all conspiracy. There was a traffic accident, and, and so the guy from BBC, which isn't pro Israel usually, said, but the Hamas took responsibility. So he said, "Oh no, everybody around here knows it's a conspiracy." So, so as a society, we're in totally different places. Thank God. But. But if something like this can grow amongst us, we have to deal with it. Part of dealing with it is having it in our faces, in, uh, in the plaque. Yeah? Yeah? Yes, okay, Bessela. Is it a little bit? No. Okay. Bessela. Yes. Speaking of different reactions, do you happen to know what happened to the murderers of your son and the murderers of the Arab boy? The murderers of the Arab boy are in jail. They, they had trial, and I think one is in psychiatric uh, detention and, one, and the, mm -hmm. the, the rest are in jail. Uh, the murderers of our son were captured in Rosh Hashanah in Hebron, and there was a battle. They had, they had automatic weapons, and they were very prepared. And two of them were killed, and the, the person, there were about 20 people in the organization, but the three direct uh, people, uh, one of them had trial and is serving three life sentences. So let me tell you a minute of, uh, about what we're going to see because we have such a short time. Um, the, the friends of Gilad and Naftali in Yeshivat Makor Chaim suffered a, a, a horrible experience and it was also the end of the year and they were going out on vacation. It was very hard being, you know, they spent a lot of the time together but then they separated and being on vacation was very difficult. Just about 10 days ago I heard one of Naftali's uh, friends describing how being on vacation was hard but then coming back, since Mekohoi was kind of a place where you, in a way, wear your heart out on your shirt. Uh, so all these pieces of Naftali and Gilad that each one of them had in their heart connected together, and they feel like, in a sense, Naftali and Gilad are living amongst, the, amongst them. Uh, I said, oh wow, so he's finishing 12th grade after all. Um, as a therapeutic act and, and in commemoration, they, they contacted the video, who was a very prominent singer in Israel, and they were working together on lyrics and music to this song. They then um, uh, cooperated with the friends, the families, and a few different uh, singers representing different parts of Israeli society, Hasidic and, and secular and all kinds of styles. And this is the song. Just thank you so much. Um, let me tell you something. I hope, definitely this year, and I hope it's going to be a long-term uh, thing, is turning into Yom Achdut Israel. And that happens in Israel, and it happens all over the diaspora. 
So if there's anything you can do to reach out to someone that doesn't dress in like you and doesn't look like you and is all different and, and you know, just remember they're your brother and sister and uh, a hug, a smile, whatever works, be part of your Mahdut Israel. Okay? Thanks. Say that I know